Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce's Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Welcome along to part of this journey with me. I'm going to start off with a quote today, which gives a reflection of or an indication of the importance of Crimea to Russia as well, obviously to Ukraine. This is a quote from someone with, with too many uh, consonants for me to pronounce. Uh, Brzezinski, I think, says, it cannot be stressed enough that without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire. But with Ukraine suborned and then subordinated, Russia automatically becomes an empire. I think that that quote is enough to explain this entire war. This is about Crimea. I say that, but they had Crimea, the Russians, and they wanted more. So perhaps actually there is a bit more to it than that. They wanted the whole of Ukraine. But where we're at now, Putin knows, surely knows he cannot have the whole of Ukraine. So now the war is about Crimea. Initially, as I've said many a time, it was a special military operation. Literally, the Russians planned for an SMO. So this whole kind of meme culture around the idea that it's not a war, it's a special military operation. Originally, it really was. They were expecting to take over Kiev within a couple of days, supplant the government, put in their own puppet uh, officials, their own puppet government into Kiev, and then spend two weeks clearing up the aftermath. That didn't happen because straight away they realised there was a massive nationwide resistance. The Ukrainians didn't want them there. They didn't welcome them with open arms and bunches of flowers. And so they were accidentally stuck in a war that they were ill-prepared for. That has been the story of this whole conflict. They've been ill-prepared for the war and their initial, their only, they didn't have a plan B, not an official plan B. There was no contingency. So when they realised they couldn't replace the government, they didn't know what they were doing in Ukraine. They were like, oh my goodness, we've got a shed load of equipment and people in there, but we haven't really properly planned. We're going to give them rations for five days. I mean, that's literally what happened. They had, they had seven-year-old rations for five days. And you know, the sort of equipment they had in their APCs were parade gear because they were expecting to just change the government and then put on a couple of parades around Ukraine and job done. And we're off now back to Russia. It didn't happen. Bam, we're in we're in Ukraine. And this is a huge problem. So yeah, just completely unprepared for a war. And so now they don't really know what their objectives are. I mean, literally, the troops on the ground don't know why they're in Ukraine. You ask the Russian troops, Igor Gherkin's done this. Other people have, have commented how they, they don't really know why they're there. Progression's really, so I think, uh, you know, uh, reference that as well. So they don't know what they're fighting for. I don't think Putin has a hugely clear idea. Otherwise, he would he would have communicated that. There, he said four things earlier, and and none of those are now obtainable. You know, demilitarization, protection, protection of the Donbass, you know, denazification. Well, it's all just gone wrong. So, really, now it's about Crimea. It really is, I think, about Crimea. And and so the bare minimum that Ukraine will want in any counteroffensive is Crimea to be theirs, or Crimea to be at least untenable for Russia to hold on to. And it's interesting that. In Ukraine, the latest uh, interview with Ben Hodges that came out today, he talks about how he doesn't think the Ukrainians will bomb the Kerch Bridge again. And I, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting point. And the reason is, is because they need that to be uh, an escape route for the Russians. They want the Russians to, he, well, he his uh, speculation is, the Ukrainians will want to hammer Crimea from a distance, make it untenable for the Russians to hold, and see an exodus of, of Russian population and possibly military personnel out of Crimea. They don't want to capture them in there and then have to invade and have some kind of war there. They want them all to run away. So there's an argument, and I think it's a really interesting one, that actually they won't hit the Kerch Bridge now. That is really important. 
as an off-ramp uh, for the Crimeans, for the, for the, sorry, for the Russians in Crimea. And then, only then, will they attempt to, to move uh, infantry and personnel and equipment into Crimea. Uh, but going back to have a little look at, at Crimea, I, I wonder whether part of this in Putin's mind is revenge. And it's really important to, to recognise this. So when Russians look back at the Soviet Union as an kind of era ro through rose-tinted glasses that they want to return to, uh, maybe a political situation or some kind of myth about what so the Soviet Union was, they want to return to that like non-existent past. They, I think, could almost look to Ukraine and blame Ukraine for the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Ukraine was, was the only geographical area within the Soviet Union that had a referendum in 1991, you know, before Gorbachev resigned, I think. They, they had this referendum where, as you can see here, 84, 83.5% of the population voted really high turnout. 82% of that really high turnout voted for independence. That's a kick in the teeth. When you, when you look down at the details of this, you have a massive 95% in Western Ukraine and Kyiv region voting for independence. I mean, that is that is as as unanimous as you're going to get in a public vote, really. But where they would have hoped that Crimea would have held on for the Russians, even there, 54% voted for independence. And that has only shifted up until 2014 in terms of popularity for, for the remaining part of Ukraine. It was only when Russia invaded, held this kind of false referendum, and then shipped in a load of indigenous Russians to live in Crimea, that the idea of Crimea wanting to be part of Ukraine or Russia may have changed. But even then, there's no proper idea of what they believe there because the referendums have been held at gunpoint and it's just completely undemocratic. So you would want a free and fair referendum, but you'd also want to return those Ukrainians who fled Crimea uh, after 2014 or, or prior to. So there needs to be a, a lot of thought over holding referendums in Donbass and Crimea. But the idea that, uh, including Crimea, Ukraine in 1991 rejected being part of the Soviet Union so overwhelmingly is possibly something that people who look back with rose-tinted glasses at that era might, might blame Ukraine for. They might blame Ukraine for the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and therefore that feeds into their justification of this war. And I think that's really important to recognise. So I thought I'd talk about that. Anyway, uh, moving on to a thread here. This is someone saying, in Israel, awards are given only to combat soldiers and officers who have exhibited extraordinary bravery and courage on a battlefield. Compare these two individuals. So you might not recognise the guy on the left, who's an Israeli uh, military per uh, person. And on the right, we have Sergei Shoigu, who's a defence minister. Now, on the left is Aviv Korchavi, the chief general of the Israel Israeli Defence Forces, or Israel Defence Forces, IDF. He has almost 50 years of military experience. The only awards that he has are for the combat service during three conflicts. You can see three little ribbons on his shirt. Uh, and on the right is Sergei Shoigu, the Minister of Defence of Russia. He's never served in the army. Wow, look at that. That's that's an insane uh, situation there. You know, he's got a, a blazer that is absolutely you know, weighted down. I'm surprised he can he can walk straight. Uh, as he I'm surprised he doesn't veer off to the left. Uh, as Chris O'Wiki here says, Sergei Shoigu, Shoigu's chest full of medals has been highlighted here. Who and the person points out that the Russian defense minister has never served in the military despite his uniform and decorations. But the full story is both ridiculous and revealing. Shoigu, as Roman notes, is a civilian. He was originally Boris Yeltsin's minister of emergency situations, equivalent in the U.S. to the head of FEMA. Appointed way back in April 1991, he served in the role until Putin made him defence minister in May 
2012. This really could explain quite a lot, right? A native Tuvan, his ethnicity is an important consideration. Shoigu is a longer-serving Russian defense minister since Count Dmitry Milutin, uh, from 1861 to 1881. His corruption and incompetence, this is Shoigu, has, have been criticised for having catastrophic effects on the Russian armed forces. Nonetheless, Putin likely sees Shoigu as the ideal defence minister. As a non-ethnic Russian, he's effectively disqualified from the top job. He depends entirely on Putin for patronage and protection, his kresha, and he is slavishly loyal to Putin. Uh, so what are all those medals doing on his chest? In short, many of them aren't military medals at all. Shoigu has spent his time inventing or re-establishing literally hundreds of decorations, some of them for nothing more than having attended a parade. Let's break down the medals that Shoigu likes to wear to the annual military parade to commemorate the end of the Great Patriotic War. Left to right, shield of the honoured rescue worker of the Russian Federation. Badge of the Graduate of Russian Academy of Public Administration under the President. So he's a graduate of the Russian Academy of Public Administration. And that gets him a military-style medal that's chess. Badge commemorating 200 years of the Ministry of Defence of the Russian Federation. It's not even a personal badge. It's literally just, that's well done. The Russian MOD has been around for 200 years. Have a badge. Uh, Order for merit to the fatherland, second class. Gold star medal for the honorary title of hero of the Russian Federation. Top row, left to right. Order of Alexander Nevsky, order of honor, order for personal courage, medal defender of free Russia, medal in memory of the 850th anniversary of Moscow. Wow, so he gets a medal for Moscow being 850 years old. Bottom row, from left to right, medal for services in conducting the all-Russian population census. He's got a medal for conducting the census. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh so much. Yes, I should. Uh, medal in memory of the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg. It's, wow, I'm surprised he hasn't got like 500 medals for the, the age of different places around Russia. I mean, why not? Medal in memory of the 1,000th anniversary of Kazan. Wow. Medal, 200 years of the Ministry of Defence. Medal for, I thought we already had one of them. Medal for the return of Crimea. Wow. I wonder if you get a medal for the loss of Crimea as well. For the return of Crimea to Ukraine. Medal participant of the military operation in Syria. Uh, Order of St. Andrew the First called. A start of the Order of Merit for the Fatherland Second Class. In addition, not displayed here, Shoigu has at least 23 other Russian and foreign medals. They include three medals for strengthening military cooperation, medal for diligence in engineering tasks, medal of great awareness in geopolitical affairs. <laughs> as he says, as Dimitri, uh, sorry, Chris O says there, ironic. Uh, medal, 200 years of Ministry of Internal Affairs. Medal for Merit of the Stavropol Territory, Order of Rightitude for services to being correct on the territory of the Russian Federation. What the, what the devil? Order of Merit of the Altai Territory, Honorary Citizen of the Kemerov Oblast, Honorary Citizen of the Tula Oblast. He has also been issued medals by Abkhazia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Malta, Mongolia, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Serbia, South Ossetia, Syria and Vietnam. Some, uh, some of those lovely destinations. The Ministry of Defence awards 113 different medals. I meant that in slagging off politics, not the people or, or the place, but, but the regimes in, in, in installed. Uh, the Ministry of Defence awards 100... That's me checking every word I say again. No, I disagree with what I just said. I have to correct myself. I don't like being inaccurate. Uh, Ministry of Defence, he tried to say this sentence three times, uh, awards 113 different medals, of which at least 66 were established by Shoigu and another 15 uh, re-established by him. It also has hundreds more ribbons and insignia uh, in total, more than 400, of which over two-thirds were created by Shoigu. Shoigu's profligacy with awards was also evident when he ran the Ministry of Emergency Situations, during which he created more than 40 medals and insignia. And there you go, there's an infographic to show all of those. God, the Russians love a medal, don't they? Uh, the Russian MOD, I mean, they've got more medals than my kids got at primary schools. Uh, the Russian MOD's medals and decorations include awards for remarkably trivial achievements. Yeah, I bet for not coming like first in a 
not quite 100 metres race when there were 10. That's way better than some of these. Uh, the Russian MOD's medals and decorations include awards for remarkably trivial achievements such as attending parades. Remarkably, there's even a special award for participants and guests of the parade. Uh, a medal for being a guest is a medal for being offered to come to an event. Participants in Russia's tank biathlon also get medals, as do those awarded, quote, for excellent graduation from a military education institu institution of higher professional education of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. Field bankers get their own special medal. I don't even know what a field banker is. I'm sure someone will let me know. Some more recently established medals include these, shown here left to right, for the, for the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic for contributing to Congress and exhibition activities, 100 years of military trade, for participation in the main naval parade, for participation in the military parade in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the victory of the Great Patriotic War of 1941-45. to There are uh, many for service medals, such as five years of military service, service in the strategic missile forces, railway troops, aerospace forces, surface forces, submarine forces. Add to that, for merit medals, including uh, for naval merit in the Arctic, merit in perpetuating the memory of the fallen defenders of the fatherland, for merit in ensuring law and order. For I mean, what's that? Just don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't steal that thing. Well done, mate. You get a medal. Ah, yes. For merit uh, in ensuring flight safety and the door safety uh, doors or, or the exit doors are here and here. Uh, please uh, employ the uh, flight brace position, like so, and oxygen mask will come down. Uh, please pull on the tag here and inflate your life right. Oh, I've got a medal. Brilliant. Thank you. I didn't even say that very well. I didn't even know what I was talking about. I've, I've not thought about that for five years. Oh, well, I got a medal. Uh, the GRU, Russian Military Intelligence Special Forces, gets its own unique medal for merit and special activities, while nuclear forces get a medal tastefully decorated with a picture of a nuclear explosion. Shoigu's medal for the return of Crimea has an interesting story. Its existence was denied until 2018 when Shoigu first wore it in public. The medal dates the start of the operation to seize Crimea as 20. The 20th of February 2014, while Viktor Yanukovych was still the president of Ukraine. Russian investigative journalists discovered that the contract uh, for the medals was advertised as early as December 2013, only a month after the Euromaidan protests began in Kyiv and were concluded on the 13th of January 2014, with Moshtamp Plant LLC awarded the contract. If that doesn't tell you that there was an invasion, which now Putin admits, an illegal invasion into the Donbass and Crimea, then, I don't know, pro-Russian voices, jog on. Uh, this Russian, uh, sorry, the, uh, no, I uh, my uh, mouse has stopped working, as ever is the case. This suggests that Russia was planning to seize Crimea well before Yanukovych was deposed on February the 22nd and probably intended to seize it, whatever the outcome of the protests and the referendum. Uh, Russian propaganda had claimed Crimea was Russian since as early as 2001. The Russian MED issues medals and awards in huge quantities. At least 212,750 medals and 32,000 other insignia were awarded in the first half of 2015. By 2018, at least 573,000 medals and 45,000 other awards were given out. When Russia held its massive Vostok 2018 exercise involving troops from Russia, China and Mongolia in September 2018, 339,566 medals were awarded to the participants of uh, at the cost of almost 77 million rubles, $975,000, as much as a T-72 tank, and using more metal. I bet that metal could have been put towards building tanks. Uh, the Chinese didn't reciprocate. Ouch. Military medals have been given to some surprising recipients. Uh, the actor Vasily Lanovi, Lanovoy sorry, and nationalist singer Oleg Gazamanov were both awarded the medal in memory of the heroes of the fatherland. The latter also received a medal for strengthening the military community. Oleg Gazmanov, entertainer Vladimir Vinukur, and pop singer Zara all received a medal for being a participant of the military operation in Syria, presumably related to their cultural work in support of Russian forces in Syria. Oh, well done then. 
I mean, they may not have fought, but they got a medal for singing to the troops or something. Uh, or maybe not even singing to the troops, singing for the troops back in Russia. Improbably, the conductor Valery Gergiev, cellist Sergei Roldogin, and violinist Andrei Tian were also awarded medals for the liberation of Palmyra. Medals have also gone to children from the Nakimov Naval Schools and Young Army Cadets National Movement. The story of Shoyu's medal mania is in many ways symbolic of what has happened to the Russian military as a whole, an emphasis on costly display and symbolism at the expense of actual military efficiency and integrity. Boom, drop mic. I can't tell you how important or how accurate I think that last sentence was. This really is emblematic of the whole of the Russian military here. It's an emphasis on costly display and symbolism at the expense of actual military efficiency and integrity. You think of all their parades every year that take place and all the, that equipment and all those soldiers you know, looking immaculate and amazing. It's just so, a paper bear, isn't it? Uh, just uh, Potemkin village or whatever it is. You know, it's just it's not really uh, the, the Russian military might is a myth as we are seeing. Uh, right, most of what I wanted to talk about, and my, I've already banged on for 20 minutes, was this article in the uh, Radio Free Europe, a, an interview with a Ukrainian Air Force gentleman, uh, Brigadier General Sehi Golub, uh, Golubtsov. Uh, we will be able to gain superiority in the air, an exclusive interview uh, with this man. Right, I picked out, out a few bits. He does, does a lot of talking about F-16s, as you can well imagine. As for the line of battle, Russian fighters actively use guided aerial bombs, and in addition, their planes create obstacles for the operation of anti-aircraft missile systems. It should also be noted that we cannot completely cover the entire front line with air defense systems, that is, which includes both the state border and sea coast with anti-aircraft missile systems. The number of these systems should be too large. And the plane is mobile, so he's talking about the F-16. It takes off from the airfield from a distance of 100 to 150 kilometers, goes to the desired destination and waits there for the strike group and comes out for the task of striking, launches at them, destroying or even simply including the radiation site, which forces them to give up performing tasks. So the idea that the F-16, the one of the ideas of the F-16's efficacy is in terms of deterrence. So it's not necessarily that it has to blow up enemy airframes right uh, and take them out of the sky with longer range missiles in fact they're going to struggle to have longer range missiles than than the russians still i think but if you're forcing the russians to adapt to change their behavior because of the threat of the f-16 the russians can no longer bring their vks their their air force as close to the front line as previously they could then they will become less effective and that is really important as well even a couple of planes capable of launching a missile at a distance of more than 100 kilometers will already make the enemy think and react to it. We will hide them in the combat formations of the planes we have. But if we speak seriously, in order to plan an operation to destroy or carry out strikes, it is necessary to understand that some echelon of support is still needed. To plan an operation from A to Z, I think it is worth talking about at least a squadron, at least 12 to 16 planes. Of course, we understand that the group has, let's say, 50 squadrons. So this is the R Russians. I think, and 39 airfields from which they carry out their missions against us. Of course, we would like more, but if it will be at least three to four squadrons, so that would be somewhere around 50 uh, aircraft, I think, I would, I think that in a separate direction, we will be able to gain superiority in the air and force the enemy to completely abandon the strikes they're currently making in a certain area on a certain defense lane. So again, it's the, it's causing the Russians to change up what they're doing and so that they are less able to hit uh, Ukrainian targets. Uh, it talks about R-37 missiles. These are the air-to-air -air missiles that you Russians use. These missiles can be used at a distance of more than 200 kilometers. If we simply had a platform capable of using, for example, American AIM-120 air-to-air -air missiles, they have a range of about 180 kilometers. So we would simply not allow them to approach the borders at the launch distance of these missiles. So it's saying, okay, we we might not be able to match them missile for missile, but we will have much greater distance range than we presently do, and that will just push the Russians further back. 
Now, in order to use these area bonds, so talking about things like the uh, JDAMs, we, in order to use these area bonds, they are forced to come to a distance of 40 to 50, 45 kilometers. Sometimes they take risks. So you're talking about the Russian ones here, the FAB 500s and, and whatnot. And in order for them to fly further, they approach a distance of even 30 to 35 kilometers. So they are getting 30 to 35 kilometers away from the front line, releasing their bombs, and which shows that really that those bombs are only being used on the front line or marginally behind the front lines. They can get up to maybe 10 kilometers behind the Ukrainian front lines. In Kherson, we are seeing them basically being used to attack the other side of the Dnipro River. So really, it is the front line. And that's how cautious the VKS are being, the Russian Air Force are being. There are areas we do not have enough anti-aircraft systems, and they can do that with impunity. Where there is an opportunity, they are destroyed. They drag the aircraft back deep into their territory. In the presence of F-16 aircraft, we could simply prevent them from reaching these borders. So that kind of bombing would stop. That would be the deterrent effect of the F-16s. They would refuse to use these bombs because then they would fall on the heads of their own troops. Then he goes on to talk about uh, the use of F-16s, where they would have them. It would not be possible to simply hide the planes. I think here it would be necessary to look for a comprehensive approach to mask and disperse from move to airfield to airfield. So they would have them moving around all the time so that if they were detected, it might be the next time they aren't there. And so the Russians wouldn't be happy with you know committing to missiles to take them out and so on and so forth. So that kind of effort um talks about again about the f-16 here uh, there are peculiarities in terms of western technology so western technology is more demanding soviet airplanes were made let's say for those airfields that were able to be built now the runways are better there are no such joints so there used to be joints in the airfields uh probably for the expansion of the concrete so on and so forth um differences on these concrete slabs in the west therefore the landing gear is weaker uh, they lighten the design so that there is more payload, namely weapons, and not to carry more iron in order for it to be strong and withstand the load during landings and takeoffs. In other words, Western airfields are, are nicer. Uh, they don't have those joints, and therefore they don't need a strong and robust landing gear, which adds to the weight. The, the Western airframes are more about carrying more ordnance rather than more robust an airframe. In 2021, though, he says, an inspection was carried out by representatives of Lockheed Martin. Three airfields were proposed for inspection. I will not name the airfields, but the, those, these are our usual military airfields in different parts of the country, eastern, central, and western. It was concluded that runways and taxiways are perfectly suitable for the normal operation of F-16 aircraft. So there you go. Uh, happy days there. Uh, the weaponry we received has improved performance. So now we're talking about... Uh, ordnance rather than the munitions rather than the F-16s. So the weaponry we, we received has improved performance somewhat. Moreover, we did not have harm. These are anti-radar, anti-radiation missiles. So that's what you'd shoot to take out surface-to-air missile systems or at least the radar that they're dependent upon. Without the radar, they, they can't fire at anything because they can't detect it. You can't acquire a target. But as you turn on radars, you are then giving out a signal that, where you are. And this is why it's... it's kind of like this paradox that the more you use it the more the more you're going to spot targets but the more you become a target yourself and so how do you most efficiently and effectively use radar so that you maintain safety for, for your own system um but anyway harm missiles moreover we didn't have harm radar anti-radar missiles at all and they helped turn the tide of the fight against the air defense, but the effectiveness of their use would be much better with the F-16. They have a special receiver that gives the pilot information about which of the enemy's anti-aircraft missile systems is operating from which azimuth. That is, the rocket is launched precisely at the working complex. This would make it possible to increase the efficiency several times. The same applies to other means, such as, for example, smart bombs and planners. We program them on the ground, although the F-16 aircraft would allow this programming not to be done on the ground, but to work on targets that would be detected in flight. This would also increase efficiency. Uh, so in other words, they, they have to make sure everything is targeted on the ground before the plane takes off at the moment with the Soviet uh, era airframes and using the American or Western munitions, they lose functionality. 
still using them. So that functionality would, would be enabled with the usage of the F-16. But, uh, you know, it's about being able to detect targets while the F-16 is up in the air and say, right, we've got a target, let's fix on it, let's fire, rather than having to program it from the ground previously. And if things change, then obviously that messes up the whole mission. Uh, so if your target is moved and, and whatnot. And this applies to the most... Uh, almost the entire line of weapons. I mean high precision, which pilots on NATO planes use not just programmed from the ground, but are used depending on the situation, which is in real time. Uh, then he goes on to say, uh, talk about uh, no matter how many aviation equipment are given to us, adapted for use on our planes, they will still not be used to their full potential. So this is the idea that adapting, I said this yesterday, and this is sort of confirming that there, you adapt NATO equipment to Russian airframes or Soviet old Soviet airframes, you will lose some functionality. Uh, and this is exactly what they say. We do not refuse modernization, so, uh, which is to say that, hey, we could strip out all the stuff from you know old MiG-29s and replace it with all the components. So we don't necessarily have to get F-16s. We just turn the MiG-29 into some kind of FD, F-16 parallel with all NATO equipment. So we do not refuse modernization, but if we take a MiG-29 and then in order to turn it into an F-16, it's necessary to completely throw out everything that is inside and insert it into what is in the F-16. It's possible, but how economically feasible is it? Still, both the resource of the F-16 and the technological maturity of these aircraft far outweigh the MiG-29 aircraft. Therefore, it's more appropriate to change the platform. And just a few more bits to talk about the Zuni missile. What is a Zuni or Zuni rocket? It's unguided. So this has actually been around for a long time, the Zuni, since the 1950s, uh, used by the US, the French, and Ukrainian Air Force uh, now. So these are unguided rockets that have better capabilities than the previously used S-313. So it, it talks about we've received unguided Zuni air missiles from our partner countries. These missiles are of slightly larger caliber than, than the S-13 that we used. It's just that we have almost run out of S-13 and the possibilities of the Ukrainian industry manufacturing them are somewhat limited. We continue to manufacture them, but the intensity is such that the capabilities of the industry cannot be compared to the amount used by an attack aircraft every day. So these Zuni rockets fill the gap. They showed themselves much better than the S-13. They fly at a greater distance and their accuracy is much better. Uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, talk about the JDAMs here. So these are the uh, dumb munitions that are upgraded with fins and guidance to give them greater accuracy and range uh, and yeah, maneuverability or guidance effectively but the russians have such complexes as the s315 s400 they're capable of hitting targets at long distance and more than 200 kilometers these bombs can be launched at a distance of 90 to 100 kilometers from heights of more than 10,000 meters but we can't afford to do this because there's a risk of damage to the air defense system so technically you could get 100 kilometers of range but you would only do that if you had air superiority and could fly at 10,000 meters assuming that there was no air defense systems that could take you out. The higher you fly, the more vulnerable you are to those air, air defense systems. So you have to fly lower, but as you, if you fly lower, you when you launch these bombs, they don't have as, as much range because they're predominantly relying on physics. You know, So you're moving along at a fast rate, you release it, it goes, and there is some, you know, the momentum it has, it has some guidance as well and some fins and whatnot. So there's a little, little bit of, elbow room there but essentially you're relying on physics so if you're having to release it from lower your range will be much smaller um sorry i'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs uh, but we cannot afford this because it's a risk of risk of damage to the air defense system because of risk of damage to the air defense system well that's risk of damage to the aircraft actually we choose we chose we choose a, a such a combined option we launch at a slightly shorter distance but at the same time, we climb to a height of six to 8,000 meters for a very short time. So really quickly drop it and then get out there. This gave us the opportunity to both strike and maneuver to escape from missiles launched by the enemy from the S-35 or from the ground. This is the middle ground that we use. That is, aviation can perform its task, but to a depth, uh, unfortunately, somewhere of around 50, 40 to 50 kilometers. If we could do it from high altitudes, of course, the distance of influence from our side would be greater. Now, there are problems apparently with the uh, JDAMs, particularly in terms of, um, I think, getting jammed by the Russians. 
I don't know that we have seen a great use of these effectively, um, but maybe we're just not not hearing about it. I don't know. They, I was expecting to hear an awful lot more about JDAM usage, but it could just be that it's too dangerous for the Ukrainian jets to get close enough to use them effectively. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. I've got a, a little bit extra that I've chopped off the end of this video and I might release it just a little segment later today or add it onto my video tomorrow. It just made this one way too long. Uh, hopefully this is more manageable. Uh, really appreciate you guys hanging out here. Please like, subscribe, share, hit the bell, do all that kind of stuff. Thanks to all the members. I really wish I had more time to do loads of content just for the members. I just, I am so pressed for time uh, in my day. Uh, but anyway, just thank you to everyone. You're awesome. Uh, take care and I'll speak to you soon.